we're going to make our way through the risk warning and then get started. Okay, so a bit of a sort of continuation of some of the uh, themes that we've been having so far this year. Um, it's obviously a U.S. Uh, holiday today, President's Day in the U.S., so that's sort of tempering the, the volumes a bit in today's trading and uh, not seeing any particularly outsized moves in the markets. A um, bit of a sort of turnaround that's been taking place in oil prices. They were down a bit early on. They pulled back a bit. Oil prices definitely are a sort of ongoing theme, and I think the, the bounce in uh, oil prices that we've seen looks like we are putting in a bit of a bottom there. Um, at least in the in the in the interim, and that's been pretty supportive of the uh, the equity markets as well. And it's I think a large part why we've seen a big turnaround in U.S. markets and saw them on Friday put new all-time highs in the in the U.S. SPX 500 and the, the U.S. 30 was, as we trade them on our platforms. Um, and of course, uh, just what's been what's been going on with Greece? Um, you know, distinct risk. From uh, from the events in Greece, you know, if, if all things fall apart over there, there's definitely going to be ramifications. But you wouldn't really believe there was much risk if you looked at um, at the markets. Uh, like I said, German DAX putting in new all-time highs, topping 11,000 for the first time last week. And um, you know, even if you look at Greek-specific markets, there's been a lot of volatility there. But um, you know, yields have uh, come back down in the past few days for in Greece, and um, even the Greek banking stocks saw a big plunge, but have sort of come back a lot from where from these first few days when um, we had a sort of a lot of volatility last week. There was a day in which the ECB uh, sort of pulled back one of the deals they had with with Greece, and that sunk the uh, the Greek bank stocks. But they pulled back quite a lot since then, so. I think that you can just generally round the whole situation off as a general assumption at the moment that some sort of agreement is going to be come to, um, that both parties don't want a uh, you know, collapse and a, and a Grexit where, where Greece leave the Eurozone because it would be just a mess they don't want to have to clear up. And so there is going to be some kind of compromise. That was part of the rally that we got um, going on Friday was that um, you know, the, the German finance minister, Schauble, has been pretty um, bit of a stalwart throughout this, um, pretty determined not to deal with Greece. But, uh, the, um, but Angela Merkel um, offered some sort of conciliatory words saying that she thought probably a compromise would be met. And uh, we've got these, um, the Eurogroup meeting taking place today. I think general generally assumed that probably not no f absolute agreement is going to come out of this, but um, you know hopes that maybe we're one step closer to um, finding some sort of solution before the the deadline, um, which is uh, February 28th, for when and Greece have to renew uh, their their bailout scheme. <clears throat> So we're probably going to kind of chop around a little bit in the meantime, and I think probably the best way to view this is, um, you know, until there is some sort of solution found, it's just limiting the upside. I mean, obviously there is still seems to be upside in markets, and I think the main driver of that is probably uh, when I'm talking about upside, I'm talking about uh, stocks, obviously. <clears throat> I think that's probably largely driven by uh, by the ECB quantitative easing program that kicked in next week. Um, a lot of front running, all that buy, bond buying that's going to be taking place. So let's look specifically at some of these markets here. Um, as I can see, as you can see on my screen, um, you know you'll know if you've attended before. But I, I basically switch up some of the major products that are available, and some of the most liquid ones, into uh, into watch lists. So it's got indices, FX, and commodities. Got bonds there as well, and some of these kind of more interesting. Uh, no, well, not necessarily more interesting, but definitely some of the more actively traded amongst our client stocks. So some of the big U.S. tech companies and uh, um, some of the more commonly traded FTSE 100 companies. I'm not going to go into details, probably on the individual stocks, unless there was some specific interest from from any of you here. Um, but I am going to dip into the, the indices here. Let's start with the U.K. 100. Not much to be said. Um, on the, on the FTSE at the moment, uh, just because we're really just cramping into this 6900 level. We had a break of the RSI line, but not much happened after that, and we saw some distinct long wicks candles around the sort of 6790 type area, just below 6800. 
And so that definitely shows some sort of buying interest post the RSI break, which to me indicates <clears throat> a break higher seems a bit more likely than break lower at the moment. But keep in mind, this 6,900 is, is multi-year resistance. Um, and based on you know what's been happening in the last year and a half or so, this this would be a kind of longer term selling opportunity. But of course, these ranges have to break at some point. And six, about 6,950 is the, is the all time high in the FTSE 100. So we could well get a run at that, especially if there is some kind of positive uh, resolution to what's happening in Greece. Um, obviously, that, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's not a direct benefit to the UK. And so when you hear these different commentary out from politicians, um, positive or negative on the Eurozone, you know, gen generally the sort of Germany 30 or the Euro would be more um, direct plays on that. But nonetheless, with Europe's the UK's biggest trading partner. So we, I think the FTSE is definitely getting hampered um, by what's happening in Greece. So as you can see, we're, that's it. We're, we're basically in this trading range. And so if you feel so inclined, there's opportunities down around 6,750 uh, for going long, and there's opportunities around 6,900 for selling. Of course, they have to break at some point in time. And, you know, based on this longer term level, which I think we're all familiar with, you know, basically it is. Yeah, there's, just, there's definitely distinct risk in uh, in buying, but for the moment we're in that range. So there's not much more to be said. Um, you know, if you're a longer term player, um, you know, definitely got to keep an eye on that level. Short term, you can buy or sell within that range, I would say. Um, if we go over to the, the Germany 30 here. Now, this was the uh, the 11,000 we hit on Friday. Obviously, that was a very small range day. We're generally being supported by this rising trend. <clears throat> We've, we're nicely above the 21-day moving average, so the trend very much up. And if you believe this 11,000 is going to break, then you know there, a, a logical buying opportunity would be around the sort of 6, 800. That'd be a reasonable dip before before rallying higher again. Obviously, you've got that sort of 200 point odd risk below down here. Some of the lowest risk opportunity would be for, for buying into this trend would be around the 10,600. But if we do get there, I mean, we certainly could. Um, and I think still, even if we got there, the tendency would be to assume an upside break. But again, this is 11,000 is one of those big round numbers. And as I mentioned last week, when we first got there, um, or as we probably as we were approaching it, maybe was it? Let's see, where were we last week? I think last week we touched it and we'd come off. And I was just saying we probably could get another run at it, and um, but it's still a big round number. And um, so, you know, that's where we are. We've had another run to it. And uh, we've had a little false break above, close below. So we've not managed to close really above that previous peak. And that's why we're coming off a bit at the moment. Um, so, yeah, uh, you know, Buying right at a big round number like 11,000 can be a bit of a risky, risky prospect. Um, you tend to want a bit of a bigger dip, and you know that's why we had this sell-off. But it may turn out that that's not enough. It might be, we might see more selling interest up here, and we may need a dip down to perhaps this this consolidation area, which kind of fits in with this previous high about there thereabouts. And maybe so that, you know maybe the 21 days, if you want to say in terms of moving averages or not, maybe we need a 55 day pullback to to generate enough buying interest to push us through 11,000. <clears> Um, you can never say how much it's going to decline. You can just have your orders in place, and um, you know if you're uh, aggressive, you have your higher orders. If you're not so aggressive, you're down here. Um, um, that, you know that's that's literally all you can do. Obviously, you can play the breakout, but there is the risk of just another fail. You know, particularly at these big round numbers, there is the risk of the fake outs. Um, if you, if we do see a big break higher and then a close below. That you know, it's counter trend, but that could be a, that could be a selling opportunity, um, if, like a big determined false break. This one, I would argue, is is a pretty here, ne neither here nor there, a spinning top candlestick um, where you basically go nowhere and it doesn't tell you, just tells you we're taking a breath. Um, slip over to to U.S. markets. <clears throat> I guess specifically, if we're talking about some uh, data that might influence the uh, the Germany 30, you know, we 
the reason we've been part of the reason we've been having a bounce in the Germany 30 is the upcoming QE, uh, but that doesn't explain why we've had a bounce in the Euro too. And I think the two things that fit together are we've actually seen some slightly better Eurozone data coming out, and perhaps that's not such a prize, uh, surprise because it, we're coming off a bit of a low base. It's been pretty pretty poor for a few months running. You know, you would expect maybe a bit of an uptick at some point, and obviously we've had low oil prices and the uh, the weakness of the euro helping the export market within Europe, you know, you would expect that to, to assist, and there are some signs of that. We've got the German ZEW on, uh, to, on tomorrow, Tuesday, and then on, uh, on Friday, we've got the PMIs, uh, specifically Germany's you'd want to watch, and there's a bit more improvement expected there. So that could be cause for, um, you know, further movement higher in the, the Germany 30 or the euro. We can just should it? okay. Let's keep things on uh, on equity markets at the moment, so as not to confuse. But I will certainly look at the euro and just discuss why, perhaps, in the face of all these Greek troubles, etc., um, and the face of QE, uh, why we get a bit of a bounce. So I think it is those the kind of economic data. Um, so yes, looking at uh, U.S. markets again, they're closed today. And not you know, a whole lot of data this week from the U.S., except, importantly, the uh, FOMC minutes. And um, they're, they're coming out on, uh, on Wednesday. Now, basically, you can see here that we're just in this, uh, you know, in the top half of this changing, trading range. Um, you know, this... This peak was only created um, at the end of uh, end of December, um, so it's not quite the same as the uh, the UK 100, where it's a sort of multi-year resistance. This was just the previous all-time high um, in US 30. Um, obviously, on a closing basis, we made new highs um, uh, last week <clears throat> based on sort of opening hours. You'll just notice sometimes because we trade on the futures here, or our prices are based on the futures, I should say, you know, there's a bit of variation from what's quoted in, in, in the press. So um, that's why you see slightly higher numbers here, and our chart looks slightly different. We're not like at new time highs in our charts. Uh, you can see we're right in this area, the 18100. And again, it's a matter of whether, you know, if you believe this trading range is going to persist, um, then. You know, there's a selling opportunity. There is perhaps some um, logic down here from the, um, a pu you know, pull up in the RSI, um, which is still below 60. So um, not necessarily an indication that we've um, we've broken out just yet. Uh, probably what would happen is that if we actually did break above in price, you know, you'd see RSI move above 60. So by then, you you know, you're kind of chasing it a little bit. Um, so there's some indications here that we could be about to break out of this trading range that we've been in. Um, so if you believe the, trend, the, the trading range can persist, you know, it's definitely selling opportunities right in this area of uh, 18 to 18,100. So, you know, look for some short-term reversal patterns. Um, even daily candlestick reversal patterns should offer some opportunity to at least sell down to these um, moving averages and trend line, broken trend line support, which has been tested once, keep in mind. So, you know, limited scope, but 17,900, then down to 17,700. Um, Possible if you see some kind of bigger reversal up here, which you know, I tend to think probably we would see something at those highs again. The S&P, uh, the SPX 500 looks very similar. Um, I'll quickly show you that. But really, the, kind of probably the more interesting one, and perhaps the indication um, that we are going to get a break, is the SPX 500. And you can see on our charts, we did break above there. Um, we had that rising trend line support in, indicating there was gradually a bit more buying interest. And we saw that break above here. And you know, once we got above that, you know, we were more than likely going to go and test the high, which we've done and broken. So, you know, so looking good here, we're bouncing off 60, so chance of a pullback perhaps to the 50, perhaps backs and retesting the uh, the peak here before a move higher. Chance of that. But really the interesting one, I would say, is this the old uh, the NASDAQ here, which is broken out of a flag. And um, just, I would say, 
based on this technical pattern, minimum pa minimal objective is 4525. But we are at 14-year highs here. Um, you know, this, a lot of this is just thanks to Apple, just absolutely smashing it. Um, but you can see if we go way back, it only just about fits in our charts. Uh, oh, there we go. Don't know what's going on there. Doing something a bit strange on my screen, but you can see that candlestick, that tall wick, is right up in that um, 4821 is um, thereabouts the, the previous all-time high in the NASDAQ. So we've got a plenty of room to run until that. So 4525, perhaps fairly obtainable. And you can see on this monthly chart, a big old engulfing candlestick there. So chance for a pullback from that at the end of the month. But um, you know, it's looking fairly positive in the NASDAQ and that may pull the S&P and, and Dow Jones forward with it. So again, that would be, if that's a flagpole, we're looking way up there towards the, um, the all-time highs, but just based on this kind of minimum objective of the height of the actual flag itself, we'd be looking at 4525. 4500 4, is the round number that might catch some selling interest. Okay. Um, got a quick question here about... Um, <clears throat> Uh, just looking at Tesco's, <clears throat> I mean, I think there's a good good chance we put a bottom in Tesco's. Um, you know, that's not to say it's not going to bounce around a good amount in the meantime. We've had a good bounce higher. Um, so this, um, this 250 is a big round number. Um, 242 is kind of how I've drawn it on my charts. But, yeah, I mean, you, you know, that's not far off a sort of double bottom pattern, which essentially has reached its objective around here. So chance of a bigger pullback. But I think, you know, the news flow is not so horrific um, from the supermarkets. I mean, we had new, more news today that, uh, that Morrison's has, has, has today cut its um, prices on core products by as much as 50%. So it's quite a crazy price war going on. And I think you've got to kind of assume that some of these companies are just not going to be as profitable as they once were because they're cutting into their margins so much. But probably enough reason for some upside is that um, they're slowing, you know, they've, they've seen sales growth as a result of cutting prices. And uh, even though they're still losing market share to the likes of Audi and Lidl, that, um, that the growth in market share from Audi and Lidl you know, you would assume would probably slow down um, as the big supermarkets cut their prices closer to Audi and Lidl, which is obviously the main advantage to going there is, is, the, is the lower prices. Um, so then if that market share slowdown can happen, I think that's a good sort of general headwind for the sector. So not to say we can't dip in the short term, but I think the... Um, you know, we're up and above the 200-day uh, the moving average as of last week in Tesco's. Um, could still offer a bit of resistance technically. You know, so I think it, you know, one way to look at it might be if you are feeling positive towards Tesco's, um, no need to buy right at the highs. But, you know, if we do get a dip down to, say, 200 again, you know, that would be a round number that might attract a lot of sort of institutional type buying. And that would be something to look into don't have to buy right at the level, we'll look for a bit of confirmation back above 210 again, something like that. You know, that, that um, for a longer term investment could be of interest. Okay, away from share markets then. Um, we did briefly mention, um, oh, we did mention the euro, so let's jump to that. I think this probably would have caught a few people off guard, the, um, the euro of late, just because in the face of all that's happening in Greece, and um, the, the prospects of QE, you would think, and you know, all you probably hear on the, the financial media is that euro just has to go down and down. Maybe that is the case longer term, but you know, you can't go straight down. And uh, we've seen some better economic data. The market was heavily oversold, and so there is a bit of cause for some upside here. Um, this colour that I've got on my chart is this kind of declining type flag situation. So if you're going off of this, 
we just think that we could drop down to sort of this uh, 103 type mark. The flag doesn't suggest parity, but it depends how long we'd take to get down to the bottom of the flag. Could be just above parity by the time we get there if the excel if, it, if the um, the price decline slows a little bit. So that that's um, a general or longer term objective to keep in mind. But you know you've got to have deep pockets to be selling right now with that in mind because it may bounce a good amount in the short term. And um, we saw quite a sharp reversal the week before last, but then the last week we still managed to bounce in the face of that. So that is a sort of hanging man type pattern. It's not really at the top of the market, but it's just at the top of a small bounce. And that's typically a bearish pattern, but um, you saw upside after it, and that's, so that's a strong sign on the weekly chart. You can see where we are. We basically just held on to this. Um, 1270 pretty strongly. So I think if that gives way, we're probably heading down to the lows and probably breaking them. That, that's been the sort of new line in the sand is that 1270. So any drops down to there, I think, are opportunities. But, you know, we have tested it a few times and now we're up and above the 21 day and there's a good chance we're up towards the, um, the 55, which would correspond to the about a 50% probably of this big decline that we had. If we just draw that on. You can see the 50% retracement is right on the top of this kind of trading range here. And then I had this uh, level up here, which is the, the 120 round figure, I believe, or just above it. Um, and that's the 61.8%, so you know, potential there. Um, the trend is probably still down. Uh, we're still talking lower low. Sort of a higher low here, but not really. But you know, if we are able to able to make a higher high, then you probably could call that a low, and then that would be more of a kind of logical sign of a reversal. So probably can start getting a bit more confident in that move once we break this sort of 1545, 1550 sort of um, previous peak, basically from from the beginning of Feb. And I think, like I was saying, the main catalyst for that would just be some ongoing better data. The German confidence data has been improving for a while, so risk of a Disappointment, but I think the, you know on an individual month. But I think um, overall the kind of trend is for improving confidence. And one of the big reasons for the collapse in business confidence was the situation in Ukraine. Obviously, we've had a new ceasefire signed there, so that won't really be in time for this month's figures. Um, but bear it in mind for ne for next month, we could see a big leap in um, in business confidence if there is some sort of confidence this ceasefire can take hold. And again, those PMIs on, uh, on Friday could be big catalysts for, um, for a jump in the euro. Obviously, there's that US dollar end of the equation. Um, so that's, you know, that's, that's worth bearing in mind. We do have the, the FOMC minutes. If we, I'll pull up the, uh, the dollar yen chart because that's, um, that had an interesting move on, uh, on Friday. Was it Friday? No, it was actually Thursday. We had this big bearish engulfing candlestick um, right around just, I mean, just ahead of this one twenty seventy. There was the these previous peaks. Now that's a big bearish. You know, at a previous resistance, a bearish engulfing candlestick like that, generally a pretty good bearish sign. We had a bit of follow through, and just finding a bit of support on the um, on the twenty day, twenty one day moving average. Um, so I think move, moving back into that candlestick somewhere, you know, ahead of the 120, um, you know, if you believe in the strength of that pattern, it's potentially a selling opportunity, at least down towards the uh, the bottom of the range. Uh, you know, then we're talking 400 odd pips if, if were that to come together. That's, but that's obviously based on the kind of US dollar strength situation. So what could bear that out? Um, we had. Uh, you know, conversely, we had the Bank of Japan data overnight, but I really do think the dollar is the bigger bigger driver at the moment. I don't think the Bank of Japan are moving again to ease policy. We do have the Bank of Japan meeting this week, so there's a risk that they do sort of uh, try and match the European Central Bank almost by upping the amount of QE that they do. I don't think that's particularly likely. They're probably going to hold hold steady the amount of QE that they're currently doing. So that kind of takes the, the, the yen out of the equation a little bit and leaves it to the dollar and the FOMC minutes. The last statement from the Fed was pretty bullish. So then 
Um, probably the statement's going to confirm that. Um, the only thing that I think would maybe be a bit of a bit surprising to that kind of overall bullish sentiment is in the statement they mentioned the sort of international concerns or something to that effect. Uh, a bit more emphasis on or the way that, you know, what's happening in the likes of Greece and China and things could impact the U.S. economy, um, and particularly if they do mention the, US do the strength of the U.S. dollar as a concern, that would be, um, that would be an indication that maybe they're going to hold back on a, on a rate hike because of those concerns outside the U.S., and, uh, and that could be a dollar-negative scenario and a positive, uh, so dollar-negative dollar-yen, positive uh, pound-dollar, euro-dollar. Obviously, the pound has its own event risk this week. Probably most of the data is going to be UK-centric this week, which is just the uh, UK unemployment and um, the Bank of England minutes. Now, we've technically we kind of reversed um, the, the, this trend. We you know we've pushed above 55-day moving average, but that's kind of the last thing that's happened. We've seen a basing pattern there with something along the lines for triple bottom slash inverse head and shoulders, a kind of shallow one with a new high made here, then a new higher low. So looking quite strong here, chance of, of a pullback perhaps to 52.70, which is a kind of longer term level um, that I had on the chart. But um, but looking quite solid in the pound, perhaps some resistance ahead, but still that's a few hundred pips away. Um, so. With the Bank of England, um, we, you know, obviously we just had the um, inflation report last week. They were sort of, um, I, I think, fairly neutral, but the market consensus was a bit like the Bank of England were a bit more hawkish because they raised their growth outlook for the UK economy and just said that the inflation could dip even to deflation on the headline number. But they just said, well, it's because of oil prices and our projections are still that we're going to hit the 2% um, inflation target. Um, in the in the sort of medium to longer term, so that was interpreted as well. We may see some sort of interim dip in, in inflation, and they did even allude to the, the possibility of cutting rates further, even from 0.5%, um, and uh, even doing starting up QE again if uh, if the sort of inflation became uh, the deflation became a bit more embedded. So that's kind of interesting that they would even consider that. <clears throat> Uh, but overall, I think deemed a bit hawkish based on the, on the growth forecast and that. That, I think, is the kind of underlying theme for the pound is that um, we've got a bit more of a kind of hawkish Bank of England who are viewing this oil price effect on inflation as transitory. And um, uh, so that's, you know, I think that's any data that I think when you once you establish a sort of a, a trend um, uh, or a logic, then you're just looking for data almost that goes counter to it. So if we see some kind of data, that sort of weak economic data for the pound, for the UK, that in the context of that latest um, you know, inflation report is a uh, is potentially a buying opportunity. So see what these minutes have to say. They may elaborate on um, some factors that were a bit more dovish on the economy. Um, but I think overall, we're looking at a potential reversal there. I think that's the kind of main. Well, what, I guess one quick side issue um, is that keep in mind the kind of uh, margins are a bit higher these days on the Swiss pairs. But we do have um, the chairman of the, uh, the Swiss National Bank, Thomas Jordan, speaking on Wednesday. So, craziest chart on offer. Is obviously the the Euro Swiss. There is some rumour that they actually the Swiss National Bank had been buying into this, creating a bit of this kind of demand here. And you can see it's a bit, a bit perverse to be doing any technical analysis, but that kind of initial bounce back that we had on the day is kind of capping prices at the moment. So I think probably a catalyst for whether we head back into that range or break higher will probably be what uh, what Jordan has to say on on Wednesday. At, uh, sorry, that's actually tomorrow at five at five o'clock. That's a by the by. Um, probably not going to be too much said there, but you know who knows after that removal of the peg and shock the whole market, they could reintroduce it. Uh, you know, and, and anything could happen there. So worth watching. Uh, five on uh, on uh, Tuesday tomorrow. Uh, quickly jump over to the commodity side of things. 
So here's Brent. Um, Brent's looking a bit more constructive than w WTI, arguably. Um, we're basically 60 has been, you know, I would, I would say is the big psycholog psychological level that we've overcome as of as of Friday, and that's kind of changed the dynamic here. So we've made, you know, made kind of higher lows from that base there, and the, you know we kind of started stalling out a bit at 60, but as of Friday and today we've pushed beyond 60, um, and uh, and beyond the 55-day moving average. So I think there's some scope for a bit of a run higher here, um, some short covering possibly up to 70. And then, you know, I think us really crashing down and making new lows seems less likely at this point, you know, based on the, the recent price action. You know, obviously it's a really steep downtrend and would due a bigger correction. So whether around 70, um, perhaps people take the long view and think, well, that's enough. Um, that's a good opportunity to sell into this ongoing um, supply demand issue. Um, that's possible. But I think in the meantime, we're probably going to push up towards it, and it's going to be the, the fluctuations to date, and I think it's probably going to continue basically being around the, um, the inventory numbers um, that come out every Wednesday and the, the U.S. rig count that, um, that comes out on the Friday. Inventories have been going higher and higher, showing there's more and more supply, um, you know, less, um, the more more oil is being created than is being demanded um, in the U.S. So that's the um, inventory numbers picking up, but the number of uh, rigs digging oil out of the ground is coming down. So we've got two conflicting pieces of data. The markets are kind of following the um, uh, the rig count at the moment, and then um, you know every now and then we have reports from um, the IEA and OPEC and uh, the likes that um, put their forecasts in about supply and demand for the, for oil uh, globally. So those are always things to watch out for as well when they're on the economic dog. There's none of that this week, though, mm -hmm. uh, to my knowledge. Um, gold has been fairly confusing. Um, So I had the kind of a bearish, um, no, sorry, uh, inverse head and shoulders pattern there. Um, we've come back, we've tested that neckline essentially, and that's what we're moving off at the moment. That corresponded with a 50% pullback. The, the runoff here is not being, to me, you know, it also corresponded with this bump off the 40 RSI. So technically sound, but I think we definitely need to push through this little consolidation area to be feeling a lot better about this. I think there's a good chance that, Somewhere in a, before this peak, probably we're going to drop and head down to the the, the one two hundred again. We may not, but um, gold does tend to react quite a lot of these sixty one point eight percent retracement. Um, I said, oh, am I going to prove? I haven't. I didn't double check this beforehand, but um, yeah, you can see there. Uh, that's you know this where we're bouncing off at the moment is also the sixty one point eight percent. So we had a confluence of FIB levels and the trend line. So a lot of support there. Um, certainly plenty of justification for buying around this level, but um, it's just the reaction has been a bit bit tepid. Probably gold is always a bit tepid going into, normally going into the, the jobs numbers and the uh, Fed minutes and Fed statement. It's always a bit a little bit sideways in gold. Uh, and so that may be the reason that people have not been so heavily buying into it. But uh, yeah, and we're below all the moving averages. We're kind of, you know, we're you know, it's, um, sort of trending down here um, in, the, in, in the short term at least. But is that in the context of a kind of just, you know, um, wider ranged uptrend potentially? So one of the less obvious markets to, to play at the moment. But you can see also if we did get another drop down to here, that would be the this rising trend line. So here and a drop down to one two hundred potentially buying opportunities, but you know, that's not to say we certainly couldn't just roll completely over following this recent trend down. Now, but we're overrunning a tad here, but I will just quickly have a look at um at copper because I think that's potentially interesting here. Um, this is something I've written a, uh, a full report on. It's on the uh, news analysis section of the website. Also did the video snapshot on this um, last Thursday. Um, just talking about the potential 
of a bottom ink over here, particularly after some of the um, recent policy um, announcements from the People's Bank of China that have been basically loosening monetary policy a bit recently, and that potentially could um, stimulate the Chinese economy and push up physical demand for uh, for copper in the industry over there. So some kind of sharp bite, uh, bounces off this 2.45, um, and we've made it above this previous peak, but not a close above, and this peak over here, but that's kind of where we're bouncing off. So chance of a deeper pullback, really what we need is a move beyond this 2.66 to call this a, you know, do you discount that spike, arguably an inverse head and shoulders, or just as a double bottom perhaps from those two, but certainly some sort of, not certainly, but potentially some sort of reversal pattern should we get a move beyond that sort of neckline there could push us right up to this um, 295, 300 type vicinity, which is on the longer term. Uh, um, you know, as long term as the 50% level. Okay. I don't see any other uh, any other questions at this point. So um, thank you very much for attending all. Uh, good luck with trading this week. Hope that was of some use. Um, uh, you know, and for market updates throughout the um, you know throughout the day, throughout the week, certainly feel free to check us out on, on Twitter. I'm J Lawler underscore CMC at Twitter, and then we've got M Houston underscore CMC at Twitter as well. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks for joining. Good luck. Jasper Lawler signing out.